the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you say, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. For we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of work, and base things of the world, and the things which are despised, which hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who God is who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for bringing us together this evening. I pray that you would be with Brother Gabriel as he preaches, fill him with your Holy Spirit, and please bless us and edify us with the message from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, good evening, everyone. Um, pastor's down in North Carolina, so he asked me to preach the evening service for him, so be with him in prayers as he gets down safely. I know he's having uh, problems with his car, so just pray for him that he gets there safely. Um, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm preaching an expository sermon. I'm not preaching topical. We're just basically going to go through the chapter, seeing what the Bible has to say for us. Um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians verse 1, it says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are rich by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. So basically Paul is going through his basic, you know, rendition as he gives in every epistle. He's saying the grace of God be with you. He's introducing himself. And he says something very interesting in verse 5. He says that she may be enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Now, 
I'm kind of, I'm not doing a disservice to the passage, but I really want to get to verse 11. That's where it kind of picks up. But as we go through this introduction, Paul is telling them, hey, I'm writing to the saved people. And that's where the epistles are written to. They're written to saved people in the church. And specifically in Corinth, now Corinth is where? It's in Greece. And the epistle to the Romans was to the Romans, all right? So you're gonna, I want to just demonstrate from this passage how Paul kind of addresses some of the cultural nuances that they had in Greece. Now, it says in verse 6, it says, Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, isn't it interesting how he's talking about salvation? Now, a lot of false religions believe that we can confirm ourselves. But here it says that Christ confirms us. All right, It's by him and his mercies that we're saved. But then it goes on to read, God is faithful, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now, if you would, go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Now, we're getting into a very interesting passage. Now, he gives his introduction. He's talking. He's greeting the church formally. And now he's saying, okay, I'm giving you my greeting. Now, here's the problem, all right? Right away in chapter 1, he's addressing this issue at Corinth. Now, he says there are divisions among you. There are people who are saying, as he says in verse 13, well, excuse me, verse 11, it says, For I have been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of glory, that there be contentions among you. Then it says, Now this I pray, everyone saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas. And he asks this question, Is Christ divided? Now, where do I believe they're getting this mentality of, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos? Well, I think because they're Greeks, they're getting it from their own culture. Look at Acts 17. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse, let me find it, 17, it says, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue, this is Paul, with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou spakest is. <clears throat> now, if you're not familiar with the Epicureans and of the Stoics, Epicureans were basically founded by this guy named Epicurus. And believe it or not, the Catholic monastery has actually came from his schools because he was of the philosophy that he believes that what makes people happy is living with their friends. And so the Catholic Church basically adopted that. And then it says Stoics. You ever hear people say he's a very Stoic person? Like he seemed very Stoic. We'd oftentimes use that with people who are very serious, kind of. And that was actually started by Zeno of Cyprus. But I didn't say all that to tell you the history. I said all this to say that in Greek, philosophy was a very prevalent thing. And of the Epicureans and of the Stoics, well, where is Corinth located at? It's in Greece. And one of the issues that Paul is addressing is this philosophy of division, how we're going to divide on doctrine. We're going to divide based on man. And Paul says, no. He says in verse 13, you can turn back to 1 Corinthians, he says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now listen, there are certain doctrines that we ought to divide over. Obviously, we ought to divide over the doctrine of the Word of God. The King James Bible obviously is the Word of God. We ought to divide over salvation, but these people are dividing over the wrong things. I believe that these people are paying favorites. They're looking at Paul and Cephas and Peter and even Christ, it says. And he says, is Christ divided? You should not be dividing over people, all right? This is what we should be divided against. We should all be divided against the world. That's the only thing we should be divided against. Now, the Bible says in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not into, into excuse me, he sent me not to baptize, 
but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. <clears throat> now, this is very interesting. Now, he's talking about baptism. Now, if you believe baptism is necessary to be saved, why is Paul saying, I thank God I baptized none of you? So this is a good verse you can use on soul winning, but he, really, this is where I want to really pick up. In verse 17, it says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, honing on those words of none effect. Now, we're in chapter 1. Just go right over to chapter 2 and look at verse 1. It says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, what is Paul saying here? He's saying that when I came to you, I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom. What is Paul saying? I'm not trying to woo you to the gospel, all right? I don't want you to look at my speech, look at my wisdom, and that be your conversion. I want to just demonstrate the spirit and the power to you. Hey, my, my miracles testify of themselves in the power of God. Now, what's the power of God? The Bible says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the power of God. And he says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, why is he bringing this up? You know, wh why is he talking about, you know, we got through the, um, uh oh my mic's falling out. <laughs> that gets, that's not on camera, though. Okay. <laughs> I should probably put it somewhere off on my belt. All right. This is embarrassing. Cut this out, Tim. <laughs> All right. All right, where was I? All right. So your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So why is he bringing this up? What, what's the big deal with this? Well, like I just mentioned, the Greeks were known. It says in Athens that they spent their time in nothing but talking about some new thing. And the Bible talks about, in verse 22, in, in chapter 1, it says, For the Greek, excuse me, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, Paul is bringing up this subject because who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to Greeks. He's talking to the Gentiles. And he's telling them, hey, I'm not coming to you as you think I'm coming. I'm not coming to you with enticing words or excellency of speech. I'm coming with you only with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So he's saying, if I come to you with wisdom of words, if I come to you with man's speech, then the cross of Christ will be made of none effect. Look at verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the rise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 29. This is actually quoted. Whenever the Bible in the New Testament quotes something, it, it's always a good idea to go back to where that's originally found. And that's in Isaiah 29. And we're going to look at verse 13 to 14. Isaiah 29, beginning at verse 13, the Bible reads, <coughs> Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Now, this is interesting because the reason why I read verse 13 is because verse 13 in the New Testament is often quoted to the Jews. And yet Paul is writing to the Greeks. Now, it's pretty interesting how Paul chooses to use this verse in reference to the people at Corinth. And the verse 13, I'll read it again. It says, it says, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart from, far from me, and their fruit toward me is taught by the precept of men. And look at that word, precept of men. Now you have the precepts of God, and then you have the precepts of men. Now what do you think the precepts of men are? It's tradition. I'll prove it to you. Um, if you want to, you can turn to Matthew chapter 15, chapter well, excuse me, verse 7 to 9, it says, Ye hypocrites, well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, this is the quote, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, 
but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And the Isaiah is quoted as the precepts of men. Jesus quotes it as the commandments of men, which are synonymous. So, but still, that doesn't make sense. Why is he, he's talking about the Greeks. He's making a point that, hey, it's by the power of God that we're saved. It's not by enticing words of man's wisdom. It's not by um, the, the wisdom of this world. It's simply by the demonstration of the spirit and of power. So why does he bring up the Jews? Well, here's what's interesting. The same rabbis, the same scribes, the same people who were reputed as wise during the time of Christ were the exact same people that killed Jesus. That with, that's why he says that wisdom of this world is worthless. It's of none effect. Remember Nicodemus? Art thou a master in Israel and knowest thou not these things? I mean, come on. You're going to be the scribe. You're going to be the wise man. How do you not know the basic things of that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit? If I have told you earthly things and you believe in that, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? This is showing that we cannot trust the world's wisdom. The Bible says, cease my son to hear the words that cause us to err from the words of knowledge and Proverbs. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with Christ. Why is it foolishness with Christ? Because he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. He can expose the wisdom of this world by the word of God, and it's going to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart because the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of this world was manifest when they killed Jesus. The wisdom of this world is foolishness, and we ought not trust it. Now, if you would, go to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verse 9, let me find it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see, I'm so used to writing down my verses so I don't have to flip like this. You know, I'm trying to be all fancy. Mark chapter 15, verse 9, the Bible reads, But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. Now, isn't it interesting? Now, the chief priests, who are the chief priests? Well, obviously, a priest in the Bible is someone who knew the law of God. He's someone who taught the people the law of God. And they are here delivering Jesus to Pilate. He says, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that. The chief priest had delivered him for envy. Now, what is envy? I preached a sermon on jealousy before. Um, jealousy and envy are not the same thing biblically. Jealousy, for example, the Bible in Numbers chapter 5 talks about the jealousy offering, how when a man becomes jealous of his wife. Jealousy in the Bible, like, by, for example, the Bible says God is a jealous God. It's meaning that you, are, you want what belongs to you. A man ought to be jealous of his wife, and the wife ought to be jealous of her husband, meaning that you don't want anyone else to have them. You're, they belong to each other. Envy, however, in our modern vernacular, we use the word envy when we really mean jealousy. Envy is wanting something that you shouldn't have or, or someone else has. And it says, for he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. Now, what's interesting about envy? Now, go to James chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. So what were they envious of? Remember when they talked about how they saw the multitudes going to Jesus and they said all men believe on him and the Romans are going to come and take away our people and our nation? The Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the Sadducees, I believe they were envious of Jesus because they did not like the influence of Jesus. They didn't like the fact that the people were listening to them and going to them for righteousness instead of going to him, them themselves. So in James chapter 3, we find something very interesting. So remember, they delivered him over for envy. That says, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. So did the chief priests, the chief priests of Jehovah, did they have the wisdom of God? No. This wisdom, he says, descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. And what is that wisdom? But if ye have bitter envying and strife. You see, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. And if you keep reading in James, it goes on to talk about, you know, how God's wisdom, it's pure, it's peaceable. And then it says it's without hypocrisy. Now, who were the hypocrites in the Bible? The scribes and the Pharisees, the people who betrayed Jesus. And remember, these people, as Nicodemus, art thou a master in Israel and knowest not thou these things? 
These people were reputed as wise, but yet they killed Jesus. So is there, is there wisdom with them? Go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. <clears throat> Jeremiah is a very cool passage on, or chapter 23 is a very cool passage on the shepherds of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 23. I have to find it. This isn't in my notes. This just came to me. Uh, look at verse ah, 31. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness, Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit, for all this people, saith the Lord. And when this people, or the prophet, or priest, shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet, and the priest, and the prophet that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that prophet. Thus shall you say, every one to his neighbor, and every one to his brother, what hath the Lord answered, and what hath the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more, for every man's word shall be in his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of, of the Lord of hosts, our God. So he's talking about these people who are coming, and they want to know about the burden of the Lord. Basically, he, and if you read early in, in the passage, he's talking about them basically prophesying deceits, prophesying lies. And he says in verse 32, it says, they shall not profit this people. Now, I'm not a businessman, but if you're doing something to no profit, what does that sound like? That sounds like vanity. It sounds like you're wasting your time. And he's saying that because these people have basically rejected the word of the Lord and what wisdom is in them, and they want to find out, you know, what's the burden of the Lord? Well, God is not listening to them. He doesn't want to give them anything more to say because they, already, they obviously can't handle what he's already said. Now, this, I bring this up because <coughs> the scribes and the Pharisees, they had the word of God. They had the Bible. They had the books of Moses. And as Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. If you believe not his words, how shall you believe my sayings? Now, it's interesting with this because oftentimes when you deal with the wisdom of this world, they'll have something to base their wisdom on, something that's obviously commonly accepted. We oftentimes think of science. A lot of times the wisdom of this world will go by principles that are, we know are true, but then as they interpret those principles, they err drastically. A good example of this is evolution. Now, there's one part of evolution that's true. And that's just a variation within species. Like there's different breeds of dogs. Okay, that, that's the one thing that's true. But then the six other, or whatever parts, are all false. They drastically err. And that's how Satan works. He always puts a little truth in every big lie. And basically what I'm saying is that the reason why Paul has to bring this up is because you cannot trust the wisdom of this world. It's foolishness with God because it's flawed. It's not based on the precepts of God. It's based on what? The precepts of men. And so that's why I believe Paul is addressing this. Now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse, pick up at verse 20. It says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. So he asks the question, where is the scribe? You know, where is the dispute of this world? Hath God, God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And then he says, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now, go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Now, it's commonly, it's commonly accepted that the Jews required a sign. We oftentimes stress that a lot of times in, in church, how the Jews sought a sign from Jesus. They even said, we would see a sign from you. 
Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 38. The Bible reads, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, Jesus, instead of giving them some miracle, instead of giving them some sign as they wanted, he gives them a word. He gives them something to believe in. He says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the, heart, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So the Jews want to see something from Jesus. They want to see and believe. And Jesus says, you have seen, and yet you will not believe. So he gives them a word. He gives them the word of God. He gives them something to believe in. And the Bible says the faith, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, what's the substance that we hope for? What's the evidence that we have not seen? Well, I believe that faith is based on the Bible because we hope on the promises of God, and those are the things that we believe in. So the Jews seek a sign, and then he says the Greeks require wisdom. Now, go to James chapter 1. This is a very famous quoted passage. So the Jews ask for a sign, and God gives them faith. He gives them the word of God. He says, believe this, that the Son of Man shall suffer the same fate as Jonas. Now in James chapter 1, in verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So the Jews require a sign, and God gives them the word of God. He says, believe my word. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. God says, you can have it, but you better believe me when you ask for it. He says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What is the power of God? I believe the power of God is the word of God. It's the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The preaching of the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and it is foolishness to the Greeks because it is based on faith. It has to be accepted by faith. The Jews don't like it because they can't see it and the Greeks don't like it because they can't prove it. And that's the scope that we live in today. We have the people that say, I can't see God, therefore he doesn't exist. And then you have the people who deem themselves scientists who say God can't be real because it's not empirical. We have nothing empirical. We can't look at anything. We can't see anything. We can't study anything. We can't do research on anything. We can't prove God. And interesting, the same battles that we deal with today are the same battles that they dealt with back then. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 25. It says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty and not many noble are called. Now, if you would, go to Jeremiah chapter 9. I know I'm flipping a lot, but there's just so much in this passage. I'm trying to milk it as much as possible. You know, there's so much you can get from it. Jeremiah chapter 9. Now, we looked at Isaiah chapter 29 because that was actually quoted in verse 18. Well, he's quoting, <coughs> excuse me. Where he says, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He's actually quoting another passage in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. And it reads, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his strength. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now, he says in Jeremiah 9, he says the, the wise man, he says the mighty man, and he says, yeah, the rich man, yeah. Now, in 1 Corinthians, hey, Ed, in 1 Corinthians, start all over? No, I can't do that. They don't want to listen to me. And in 1 Corinthians, he says, for you see your calling, brother, how that not many wise men and after the flesh, and not many mighty and not many noble. So the only difference is that noble and the rich. It's, it's called rich in Jeremiah 9, and it's called noble in Corinthians. And it really takes effect with the quote because in verse 
29, he says that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him that are you, and it says in verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So he's basically, he's breaking it out a little bit, but he's referring, you can tell he's referring to Jeremiah chapter 9. Because he mentions the wise man, he, he mentions the rich man, and he mentions the, the, I keep getting this mixed up, the mighty man, the rich man, and the wise man. And then he tells them, hey, don't glory in that. Don't glory in your wisdom. Don't glory in your might. Don't glory in your riches. Glory in the Lord. And that's exactly what Paul says in Corinthians. Now, what, why is he bringing this up? Now, he, here's why. And the key is this in verse 26. He says, wise men after the flesh. Now, Here's the interesting, there's, we see wise men, we see mighty, and we see rich, and we see noble. There's wisdom of this world, and then there's the wisdom of God. There's the might of this world, and then there's the might of God, and then there's riches of this world, but then there's the riches of God. Now, when you think of the wisdom of this world, what do you think of? Well, the Bible says it's foolishness. It's all the people, the reputed men, like James White, who think that they know what they're talking about, but they really don't. And then you think of King Solomon when you think of the wisdom of the Bible. When you think of the mighty men of this world, you think of probably a lot of the athletes and things like that. And then the might of God, you think of Samson. You think of David and all of his mighty men. And when you think of the riches of God, you may think of a lot of corrupt men like Donald Trump, you know, the riches of the world. And then you can also think of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. There's always a paradigm. God has his riches and the world has theirs. And he says in, in 1 Corinthians that no flesh should glory in his presence. It says that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. The difference between our riches and our wisdom and our strength, and he's writing this to the Greeks, and he says the wisdom after the flesh. He says you can have the wisdom of this world, you can have the might of this world, you can have the, the, the wisdom of this world, but guess what? It's not going to get you anywhere. Because at the end of all of that, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his strength, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let he that glorieth glory, because why? He knoweth the Lord. Because it's our knowledge of God that makes us have our value. And truly, because if we only depend on what this world can give us, this world is going to vanish away. It's going to fade away. Nothing that we can take or milk from this world is going to remain. So you, you could have the Athenian, Epicureans, the Stoics. He's, he's writing to the Greeks, and he's trying to get them to see that, hey, stop glorying in one another's earthly, fleshly, worldly, sensual, devilish wisdom, and take pride in the things of God. Glory that you are reputed as a son of God. And don't take glory in being reputed as a wise man of this world, because the riches of Christ are greater. Now go to James chapter. We were here earlier. But I still want to go to this because we're not done. So James chapter 2, no, yeah, James chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 15, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, right. gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and of good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now, that's James. And he, he, he mentions, <coughs> excuse me, he mentions some attributes. We oftentimes talk about the attributes of God. Well, wisdom, the wisdom of God actually has attributes. And isn't it interesting that all these attributes might match who Christ was? Because that's why it says in 1 Corinthians, Christ our wisdom. He says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. He says, then peaceable, then gentle, easy to be entreated. Didn't he just say, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God? Isn't that easy to be entreated? Full of mercy and of good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Those are all attributes of Christ and who he was. And we know this because we can read about all these attributes in the Gospels. And then, we, of course, we have the wisdom of this world that we already touched on, the strife and the envying. Now, go back to our text in 1 Corinthians. So, in verse 27, it says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, 
And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Now, this is, this is a, I, I actually had, a, I struggled a little bit with this passage because it's kind of hard, you know, to, because I got all the way down to this and then it, it just clicked in me. Go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're already there, and look at verse 9. It says, For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. In verse 13 it says, Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and of the offscoring of all things unto this day. Now, Paul is saying, hey, he's writing to the church at Corinth, and he's telling them, we are a spectacle unto the world. We're fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise in Christ. He's saying, we are despised, and you're honored. And didn't he just say, didn't we just read in 1 Corinthians God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, the base things. Then he say we were defamed as the filth of the world. God hath chosen the base things of the world, which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. What is he saying? He's saying God has chosen you. He's saying God has chosen us because we are accounted as fools because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with us. And guess what? The wisdom of God is foolishness with this world. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And we are counted as base things of this world, he says, and the things which are despised. Well, guess what? A servant is not above his master. If they have called the Lord of the house Beelzebub, guess what? What are they going to call us? And also, if they have killed the servant, they, they killed our Lord and our Savior. And it's always funny when you have these mega pastors and they say they're following Jesus. Jesus had 5,000, you have 5 million. It's like something's not matching up here. All right, all the followers that they have. And he says, and the base things of, the, of this world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are not. What does that mean? He says he's chosen the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Now, I may be a little grammatical with this, but when I see that word are, are is present tense. Like the Bible says, I am. That's from the verb to be. God says, I am that I am. And then he says, he's chosen the things that are not, the things that are not presently with us to, for what? He says, to bring to naught the things that are. Now, when I think of this, this is what I believe this says, is that the things that are not, who is not right now? Well, I believe that God has chosen, as in Revelation chapter 19, the Christians and the saints that are in heaven, which are not presently among us, to bring to naught the things that are. God has chosen us to be the inheritors of the world. God has chosen us to have the victory. And he's writing all of this to the Corinthians. He's telling them, hey, isn't Christ greater? Though the world may repute us as fools, though we may be fools for Christ's sake, aren't we still wise in the sight of God? The Bible says in chapter 6 of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the prince of this world, that come to what? To not. And he's chosen us and the things which are not to bring to not the things that are. That's pretty cool. I thought that was really cool. That's why I'm preaching it. So, yeah. But um, also, in closing, I'm almost done. I'm trying to... Stretch this out. But go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Now, Revelation chapter 13, the Revela if you study the book of Revelation, you should know that verse chapters 1 through 6, no, chapters 1 through 12 of Revelation are one half of the book. But then it's split in another half. It's, it's being told like that. It's dividing into two sections. <coughs> now, if you will look at verse 1, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. 
And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly one was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle and then that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have me here, let him hear. Now, this is talking about the Antichrist, if you haven't caught on. This is the Antichrist. Now, in chapter 6, in verse 1, we see there's a man going forth conquering the conqueror. Now, in chapter 13, he's basically giving us his system. He's giving us his government. Now, it says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great swelling, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Now, Satan appoints, he appoints this man. And remember, we're talking about the wisdom of this world. I'm staying on track with the sermon. We're talking about the wisdom of this world. We're talking about um, the Corinthians. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And, he's, and I'm still on that subject of he's chosen things that are not to bring to naught the things that are. Now, what will be is the question that should be asked. Well, the, what will be is this one world system where basically the Antichrist is ruling. He's appointed by Satan. The Bible says the dragon gives him his great authority. And the Bible says that we will go through three year, three and a half years of tribulation. And then before the wrath of God, we will be raptured up. Now, during, now, I know I talked about this earlier, but we oftentimes repute ourselves as civilized. And I truly believe that a nation is only as civilized as its authority. For example, if you look at a child that's disobedient and rambunctious, I blame the parent. Because that's its story. If I look at a Christian whose ducks aren't in a row and he's not doing the right things and he probably does, you go to him, he doesn't know what sin is in the Bible and he's going to this church, well, I blame the pastor for not having an educated flock. He's not preaching the whole counsel of God. He's not getting what he should be getting. The authorities in the Bible, God has ordained government, God has ordained authorities. And oftentimes a people's authority figure will oftentimes reflect their state. For example, no, I don't promote Trump. I don't like Trump. Trump is an idiot. But if I was a foreigner and I thought of America, I would think of Trump. I would think of him arrogant, proud, um, ignorant, pretty shallow, pretty dim. Oftentimes God gives us leaders that reflect its people. Now, for our nation to get to the point to where we're going to murder masses and millions of people because they have a difference of religion, think about that. I mean, is that really wise? Will we repute that in our civilized society as being wise and noble? I mean, we have democracy, you know, amen? Well, he says he calls it all, both small and great, to receive a mark. I don't know about you, but if, I don't know if, what the government is going to cause me to do. You know, you're going to make me give my gun away? Like, this isn't the ideal, pristine, nice society. This is a society much like that of Alexander the Great and a lot of the famous dictators and rulers that have lived throughout history. And one of the things that characterized these societies was ignorance. Caesar burned the library of Alexander. He burned an entire library, which offset history's development and, and a lot of other things. But I bring this up to say this. The people who are going to worship the Antichrist are going to be very barbaric. Remember when Paul says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He's saying the Greeks and the wise, and he says the barbarians, and that's parallel to when he says unwise. I believe that society is going to become very barbaric. And then it's going to really become a day when they that be wise shall shine forth. You are the salt of the world. And God has given us a light to sign. And I believe that because we have the mind of Christ, we're going to be shining even greater. One of the main characteristics that I've, I've noticed, I've been reading a lot on ancient history and things. A lot of the ancients, because I, I, I want to speak anciently because, you know, we're not too far away from what man has did, has become. 
And if we don't go out and preach the gospel, if we don't get people in church, if we don't be that civilizer, because God is the one who makes the rules, then guess what? All we're going to do is just speed up the process and ruin a lot. Now, it's already going to get worse. It's already going to happen. But let it not happen because I was lazy. Let it not happen because I didn't feel like going soul winning. Let it not happen because I decided my church doesn't need to hear about this. Let it not happen because I was too lazy just to give my child a spanking. Let it not happen because I failed to do what God told me to do. It will happen. And the world oftentimes, they want to reach God through their mind. But we need to reach God through the mind of Christ. We need to reach God through his wisdom and what he has imputed to us. And I think that the world has anything to offer. Yes, you may have a college degree. You may have the whole alphabet in front of your name. But guess what? I may know more about the end times than you. I may, be, have, I may have the Holy Spirit. I may have a home in heaven. But yet the world will still repute me as foolish and shallow simply because I do not accept its agenda. You see the offset of this, uh, how, how stupid the world is becoming? I mean, just common sense should tell you when, you know, there's sodomites and, and abortion, we're pretty barbaric as a society. And I, I say this to warn us that Greek or Jew, barbarian, Scythian, we're all the same in Christ Jesus. And guess what? We all need to make sure that we're in the Bible, that we're studying, and that we're getting the mind of Christ. Because I don't want what the media or the agendas of this world have to offer, all right? That's all I have for us. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the, going into the new year. We made it through. This church has been a blessing. We've gotten, we've tallied out, Lord, on the souls we've been able to win and the people we've been able to preach the gospel to. Thank you for the people that have faithfully been attending the church. Be with Pastor Lord as he travels to North Carolina. Give him safe travels back home. Thank you, Lord. Bless the fellowship, Lord, and, and give us strength, Lord, to continue on into the next year. Help us to have, Lord, the mind of Christ and to reject the world's wisdom and to reject what the world has to offer us and, and realize that the riches of Christ are greater. We may be accused as being shallow-minded or whatever, but at least we're not hollow. At least we have the Holy Spirit in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.